Okay, so uh, for our closing keynote, obviously, uh, Ryan Gordon, many of you in here uh, refer to him as Nicholas, the gentleman who's way overdressed for our crowd, but we'll let that go because we all play the game for us. Uh, so uh, Ryan is actually a Charlotte local, and if you've played any major commercial Linux game, the odds are nigh 100% that he is the one who ported it, which means he probably has some good code stories. I do. Um, anyway, so uh, we're running behind, so without further ado, Nicholas. Okay, can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Is the microphone working? Okay, good. Um, cool. Uh, so we'll start. We're running late, thank you. Uh, we all got to make fun of a Macintosh before we started, so we're already off to a good start here. Um, my name's Ryan. This is a talk called The Linux Game Industry. Um, let's get started and we'll just try to pretend this where everything's okay. Okay, a few notes before we get started here. Uh, first off, feel free to interrupt me. If you have a question, raise your hand. I'll repeat it back so the microphone can hear it, and I'll pretend I know what I'm talking about. Uh, the slides will be at that URL. They're not there yet. I'm going to put some annotations in it afterwards and some corrections, and I will post it later tonight. So come back and check. Um, there's nothing technical in today's talk. This is all about business and money and disgusting things like that. And just uh, more important, if you're disgusted by money and, and economies, this is also about archaeology and history, which is a I find I'm passionate about, so I hope you are too. Um, if you want to tweet about this while it's going on, that's at Iculus is my uh, Twitter account. Uh, the hashtag self2014 is good. If you have positive comments, negative comments, I read them all and I laugh and cry appropriately. Okay, so this is me. Um, my name's Ryan. Uh, I've been doing this for a long, long time. I'm a hacker in the positive sense of that word. I'm a game developer, uh, and mostly what people think of me as is a game porter. Uh, Porter being, you know, Latin, Porto is to carry. I carry games from one platform to another. So I generally got, get hired to take a Windows game and move it over, carry it over to Linux. Um, I get hired to port stuff to Mac OS. I get hired to port stuff to platforms that no one's ever heard of before and probably never will again. Um, but uh, I'm a freelance. I don't work for anyone but myself. Um, people hire me on a contract basis, and I do work, and then I swoop into the next project. I've been doing this for 15 years, a little more than 15 years now, and um, uh, yeah, I, the best way to explain what I do for a living is to look at my NASCAR jacket. Um, these are some of the companies I've worked for. This is actually out of date in the last two weeks, so um, we just shipped two games last night, uh, uh, Goat Simulator and Limbo. If you haven't played them, they're both excellent for totally opposite reasons. Um, <laughs> and, you know, some of these companies you've probably heard of, like Epic Games is up there, Valve's up there, Google's up there, I did Google Earth, blah, blah, blah. Um, some of these you might not have heard of, but they still shipped really excellent games. But my biggest client right now is this lady. Um, that's what she wears when she's using BitTorrent. Um, <laughs> That's my daughter, Olive. She keeps me running. Anyway, so for those that just want to tune out and they don't really want to listen to this whole talk, because I've got about an hour here, unless I do this really quickly, in which case I have 45 minutes for Q&A. But um, here's the too long didn't read. This is how we started. This is where we are now. <laughs> Let's skip ahead a little bit. Um, OK, so if anyone has ever played this game, it's called X-Bill. Has anyone not played this game? You can tell when people started installing Linux based on whether they've seen this game or not. Basically, this is just Bill Gates, multiple clones of Bill Gates. Uh, this is actually how Microsoft operates, too. This is multiple clones of Bill Gates running around destroying other operating systems, and you have to try and squat him, squash him. Um, you know, I guess the mouse cursor probably looks like Steve Ballmer at this point, or whoever the new guy is. Um, I put this up here for one reason, is that what you might notice is this is a whole bunch of dead operating systems that were totally relevant back when this game first shipped. There's SGI workstations, there's Windows 3.1, there's what I think is Mac OS 9, there's Next Step. Um, sadly, in this picture, there's no OS 2, which is what I was using before yeah, Linux. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's the retina display. You know, it's, uh, I can't read it on this thing. Okay. I put this up here for a very important reason to say, let's skip ahead. There is so much history that I'm not going to be able to cover today. And I could talk for hours and hours, not just about uh, gaming, and open source gaming, but specifically gaming on Linux. So I had to pick and choose, and there's going to be some people that might see this talk and feel like they should have been mentioned, and I'm really sorry if you see this on YouTube and I skipped you. I had to pick and choose. I'm sorry. So just pretend that this picture of x represents everything we haven't talked about and everything that came before what we're talking about, because we're going to jump directly to 1993. Who's played this game? Everyone in the room. I love it. Good, good, good. Um, Doom is a first-person shooter. If for the one guy somewhere that I couldn't see behind the flood of hands that went up, it's a first-person shooter. It was one of the first of its kind. It was one of those games that when it shipped, everyone said, I did not know you could do that on a 386 computer. Um, 
and you basically you saw just the barrel of your gun and you ran down the hall shooting demons and the story was totally irrelevant to anything. It was mostly you run around, shoot things, and find keys, and blah, blah, blah. And it was really beautiful at the time. But I don't really want to get into the history of Doom, because there's been literally entire books written about this game, um, which you should also read. But this was one of the first commercial games, AAA for the time, uh, games that shipped with a Linux binary. Um, Doom shipped it for DOS originally. Uh, I'm sorry, id Software, the people who made Doom, shipped it for DOS originally. And then they shipped some other updated versions. I think they did a Windows version. There was actually, in fact, an OS2 version. Um, but eventually, id Software themselves ported, a Linux ver ported it to Linux. Uh, one of the employees for id Software, his name was Dave Taylor. He wrote the Linux, he ported the Linux version of this, and he put the README file in there. This is uh, from readme.linux. I'll read it to you if you can't see the screen. It says, I did this because Linux gives me a woody. It doesn't generate revenue. Please don't call us with bug reports. They cost us money, and I sort of get ragged on for wasting my time on Unix ports anyway. <laughs> True story. Um, Dave Taylor left id Software sometime after this point and started his own company, which did uh, a game called Abuse for a company called Crack.com. Please don't go there anymore. I'm pretty sure it's a website. It's a porn site at this point. Um, but uh, And he ported that also to Linux. And then he started on a big, ambitious pro project called Golgotha, which he ran out of money doing and failed and just released the source code to it. He says it's not done, but if you could cherry pick anything from this, including the art assets, including the code. It's all yours. Do what you can with it. Go wild. Um, so now we're going to jump ahead a couple of years. Who knows these people? Every time I give this talk, that the hand count goes down a little bit. That's OK. That's history for you. We all fade into the background eventually. Um, in 1999, there was a company called Loki Software. They ported a game called Civilization Call to Power, uh, which was one of the Civilization games, among many others. Um, and they basically made a big splash. They said, this is what we do. We are going to be a business. We are going to port AAA, top of the line, top shelf games to Linux and sell a boxed Linux version of it. And they did. They shipped 18 games. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it looks like 18. I didn't count. 18 games. Uh, some of these you've heard of. Some of them are a little smaller. But like you might not have heard of Eric's Ultimate Solitaire if you weren't a Mac user in the late 90s. But it was an incredibly good Solitaire game. But they also shipped really, really big games that were important back then, like, you know, uh, Descent 3 and Heretic 2 and things that are SimCity, you know, uh, Alpha Centauri, which is still awesome if you haven't played it. Um, and, and in addition to shipping these, they had one they didn't quite ship. They were working on Deus Ex when they went out of business. Um, and more importantly, these are important, this is something I need to talk about in a moment. They had two games that they didn't port themselves, but they were in charge of maintenance on, and that's Quake 3 Arena, and which they did sell a copy of, but they were mostly, it was ported when they got it. and then they had people on staff that improved the Linux version from there. And Unreal Tournament, which was poured to Linux. And I have a story about this. Um, I'm going to tell you some stories I probably shouldn't tell uh, tonight. And this is one of them. Um, Unreal Tournament was maintained by Loki. And they shipped, a, they, they shipped Linux binaries for it. You bought the Windows boxed copy. And uh, we shipped at Loki an installer uh, for Unreal Tournament that would install Linux native binaries for it and use the data files from the retail CD. Um, this happened because. Epic, ship, Epic Games, the people who did Unreal Tournament, shipped uh, source code to some parts of Unreal Engine 1, uh, enough that you could you know, put your own renderer into it if you want. But you didn't get everything you needed to build the game from scratch. Uh, they called it OpenUT, and it was a briefly lived project. But they did that, and they had a Linux port that they did in-house. And when you took those two things, you could do, say, a better OpenGL renderer for the existing Linux binaries. And there was a guy in Germany named Daniel Vogel who did uh, some work on OpenUT and made a much, much better OpenGL renderer for the Linux version. And that got so good that other licensees of Epic started shipping Unreal games with Daniel's OpenGL renderer. Uh, Epic started shipping it, and it was faster and more feature complete than their direct 3D renderer. Um, Daniel now works for Epic Games, which is perhaps not surprising. In fact, he's one of the, their technical leads there now. But at the time, he was working for Loki Software. He was there on a work visa in America, in Southern California. And one night, he was angry at Tim Sweeney, the guy who runs Epic Games. And he said, you know, we, I want to do more with OpenUT. And they're not giving us source code. They're not helping us out. So he wrote a flame email, you know, like just a rank, angry middle of the night, I'm just pissed at you email to Tim Sweeney. Just like, you're not helping us. You're not supporting this community. And you're, you know, some things you really shouldn't say to people that are much richer than you. But um, Tim Sweeney got that email and wrote back in the morning and said, well, why don't I throw Loki a couple thousand dollars and you guys can maintain the Linux port? <laughs> so sometimes your anger can be well focused is what I'm saying. So Loki did that. Um, 
I have so much I can say about Loki, but I'm, I don't want to spend all the time, the whole time talking about it. Mo the most important thing out of Loki, because the company doesn't exist anymore, you can't buy their products, you can probably find them on the internet, but um, these games are for all intents and purposes dead, except for people that are keeping them on life support to work on newer versions of glibc and newer kernels and blah 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 um, The one thing they did that was incredibly smart is they invested an enormous amount of engineering resources into open source tools. Uh, two of the, lots and lots of them. They, they had improvements to Bugzilla, they had improvements to, they wrote their own custom soft, uh, software installer and released another GPL and it was really nice, it worked regardless of what kind of package manager you had and stuff. It was called Loki Setup. Um, and lots of other things that as bit rot goes and better products come up. Those aren't that interesting, but these are two things that were magical that they worked on and pushed harder than anyone else, and we still use them today. The first one is SDL, it's Simple Direct Media Layer. It's what we use as the Linux answer to DirectX. If you want to get to the screen, if you want to get to the audio card, if you want to get to the joystick, you probably write to SDL. You probably don't talk to kernel interfaces directly, et cetera. And when you do that, you get to talk to all sorts of different platforms for free. Uh, it works on Mac, Linux, Windows, Android, iOS, blah, 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 blah. Lots of engineering resources went into that Loki. It's the only reason it survived to this point. And we used it and enhanced it as an open source project for many years after Loki left, and we still do to this day. We're several thousand commits into our Mercurial repository now. The other project they did was OpenAL, which is an, a 3D audio library, which we needed to compete with Direct Sound 3D when we were at Loki, but it turned out to just be a generally good idea. If you have a Linux box, you probably have OpenAL installed on it. If you have a Mac, it is absolutely installed on it, starting with Mac OS 10.4. If you have an iPhone of any variety, it's had OpenAL since the day it was launched. Um, you name it, you've probably got a system with OpenAL on it. The only thing that probably has more installs by default than OpenAL at this point is probably SQL Lite. Um, so this, this worked out for Loki. Even though Loki didn't survive, we all benefited from that strategy. And Loki did some other fun stuff. This uh, attractive gentleman is sitting on something called a rock and ride, which uh, is weird looking. It's a bunch of hydraulic things in a chair and a giant CRT strapped to the front of it. <clears throat> and what those hydraulics would do is move the chair in weird and random angles. So we had hooked this up to Descent 3. So as you threw flew around in 3D space, it, this chair would whip you around. Um, we picked that up from some uh, in, inventor's garage in Southern California. Our QA guy drove over there with a pickup truck, and we hooked it up to Descent 3. And then we took it to Linux World, where Linus Torvalds played with it. I'm pretty sure he yelled, die, motherfucker, while playing this. Just, <laughs> I wish I had a recording of it. I promise he did. Um, uh, and he got whipped around playing Descent 3. But OK, nothing lasts forever. Loki went out of business. Um, and they kind of had this really remarkable operatic death spiral, which I can't get into even if I had the time, but they went out of business and then other people picked up the slack. Um, some of these you might have heard of, maybe you haven't. There's a company called Linux Game Publishing. There was a, a web store for Linux games called tuxgames.com um, and their primary uh, supplier of video games was Loki Games and Loki went out of business and they said, oh shit. Um, so they did the only thing they could if they wanted to stay in business. They started their own publishing company and tried to do the same thing that Loki did. We'll license games, we'll port them to Linux, and then we'll sell them through our retail outlet, Tux Games, among other places. Um, and they have kind of vanished. They're sort of still around, but their server is not responding, but allegedly they're still in business. Uh, two other people, two other companies up there, Hyperion Entertainment did a couple of really good Linux games like Shogo Mad and some other things, and then they decided it was more profitable to port to the Amiga. I'm not making this up, this actually happened. Um, they are actually now in the business of designing Amiga OS version 4 to run on more modern hardware than an Amiga. But, um, and then there was also Tripsoft, and there's a few others I'm ignoring here, which did Jagged Alliance, a Linux port of that, and they went out of business, and the guy that was running that now works for Crytek, or used to last time I ran into him. And then, of course, there's this guy. Um, that's me, trying to get the air conditioner to work at Loki. Um, no. <laughs> Did, you, what, you don't like my rain dance? I don't know, but um, anyway. Um, gosh, I was so attractive back then. Okay, anyway. Um, but of all those companies, they all went out of business or they all went on and did other things, and I refused to get a real job. Um, so I went and I moved in with my parents, and I worked at, I worked at cash register for a while, and I got really, really bored with that. Uh, so I made a cold call to Croatia, because there's a company out there called Crow Team that made a game called Serious Sam. Who's played that? I love that game. It's like Doom, but better, you know? Um, 
Anyway, so here, let's bump out of the 90s here for a moment. So I did Serious Sam. I just called them out of the blue and said, here's a really passionate argument about why you should do a Linux version of this game. Blah, 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 blah. You can get you to the PlayStation 2 because it's the same compiler and blah, blah, blah. And the guy wrote back to me. He's like, I'm just an artist, man. Oh, that's the only email I could find. So he forwarded me to the business people and they said, yeah, let's do it. So I did it and that caught some attention. And Daniel Vogel, who I mentioned before, who sent the angry email, was now working at Epic. And he said, we need a Linux dedicated server for this game, Unreal Tournament 2003. And so he called me up because he knew I was, you know, desperate for money and said, hey, you know, you have a mediocre work ethic, so we can probably make this work. Um, so I went out there and I did the Linux dedicated server and they said, hey, can you also get the, the game client running too so we can play the game on Linux instead of just hosting servers for it? And I said, yeah, what could possibly go wrong? So, um, <laughs> Jokes aside, it actually worked. We shipped it. It was literally on the retail CDs. If you bought the Windows version of that game, there was a Linux installer on it too. So um, it was a huge, wild success in a totally dead market where everyone had given up after Loki games. Um, and then, you know, Sweden called and I did Battlefield 1942 and that was, hilarity ensued. Um, but, but once those three things were done, and I don't have a slide for this, um, other people started calling. They said, hey, I'm an Unreal licensee, and I would also like a server. And can you do the client while you're there, too? And that lots of work came from that. And then people started calling me and saying, hey, we, we're interested in this Linux thing. So for the next 10 years, we kind of limped along this way with me kind of trying to port as many things as I could. And I did the best I could. Um, I have CDs on my wall for each game I've shipped. I ran out of room after 50 of these. <laughs> It's probably closer to 75 now. I don't know. I've, I've lost track. Um, so th that that's not successful. When you think about, even if it was 75, I don't know what the exact number is, but over the course of 10 years, that's not very many games. But, it, you know, I'm only one person. But then some other things happened. Uh, look at that. We just did a whole decade. That was really fast. Okay. Um, this game came out. Has anyone ever played this? This is called Aquaria. This is good. If you like like the Metroid type game, the Castlevania Symphony of the Night type game, take that and put it under the ocean. Uh, your character swims around. She's a mermaid thing. Um, but it, it's a good game. Had an interesting story. It delivered on a pretty big open world. It was it was pretty fun. Um, I say this because you know some guy randomly emailed me and said I would really like to get this game on Linux. Can you talk to the people who did it? And I said. Yeah, I guess, whatever. They're not going to write back to me. But it turns out it's two guys in Canada, uh, Alex Holeka and Derek Yu. And I said, hey, I think this would be interesting to do. And they said, cool, let's do it. So we did it, ported it, no problem. And I also did this. This is, I'm not going to get into a whole list of games here, but these are important for a specific reason. I also did this game, Lugaru or Lugaru. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. This is the danger of doing business over email. Um, <laughs> has anyone played this game? OK, a couple of hands. I, I'll summarize it for you like this. Take rabbits, make them humanoid, and have them do kung fu on each other. <laughs> as ridiculous as this sounds, this game is an enormous amount of fun. This game was written by a guy named David Rosen, uh, working for a company called Wolfire, which is his own company. It's, Wolfire is like David's apartment, you know, it's like, that's where it is. Um, he wrote this, I think, when he was in high school or just leaving high school. Like, he was very, very young when he wrote this. He did the art and the graphics and the... Uh, the code, everything was done by David. It was just a one-person job. Now, I got a call from uh, a guy named John Graham, who uh, you might know from a company called Humble Bundle. And at the time, he wrote to me from a wolfire.com email address, the guys who did Lugaru, and he said, We're, we have this idea, and we want to take a couple of games that we've made and our friends have made, and we want to put them in a bundle together and sell them. Like, you pay whatever you want, we give a piece of it to charity, we want them all to run on Mac, Linux, and Windows. And like, if you want to pay a penny for it, that's cool, no problem, whatever. And we'll give some to charity. And you know, just a as a side note, we would like to, if we make a million dollars on this, release the source code to these games. <laughs> that's okay, no problem. Um, and, I, and they had at the time, uh, was the, the ones they were thinking of were, was Lugaru, this, the, the bunny murder simulator. Um, uh, Penumbra, Penumbra Overture, which is a, survival horror game. If you haven't been scared recently, you should try it. Uh, and World of Goo and Gish was the other one. I don't know. I'm not going to get into the details of these games. but um, And I wrote to him. I was like, well, you know, I just finished this game called 
Aquaria, and it's, it's, it's an indie game like the rest of them, it fits that same spirit, and it's really, really good, and I think maybe you'd probably make a little more money if you threw one more person in there. And I was like, and, and this is an exact quote, and I don't have it on a slide, but it was something like, you know, in this game, Braid just finished its exclusive on Xbox Live Arcade, you should put your dick on the table and see if John Blow chops it off. Um, <laughs> so they called Jonathan Blow, the guy who wrote Braid. If you haven't played Braid, it was this wild indie success, and it's an incredibly great game. It's mind-blowing. Um, I, I would recommend you try it. It's on sale right now during the Steam uh, summer sale. But um, I, And they did. They called John Blow and he chopped it off, unfortunately. So, um, But they went with every other game. They got Aquaria in there. I don't know if you can see all these icons. You got your World of Goo and your Aquaria and your Dish and your Libero HD and Penumbra Overture. And this game showed up too, and I'll tell you why. This is the Humble Indie Bundle, they called it. This is the first one. There was no number after it because they didn't know there would be a second at the time. Uh, they also put some charities in there. They put the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So every portion of your purchase, which you could dictate. You can say, I'm going to give you a dollar if you're a jerk. If you put less than a dollar, they popped up a picture of a homeless guy saying, we'll make indie games for food. Just to, you know, you could still give them less, but you had to look at that guy if you were going to do it. Um, um, but, but there were sliders. You could say, I want this particular game to get most of my money and this game to get a little less. And there are also two charities, and you could, there were sliders for those. You could say, I'm going to give you $100, but I want all to go to the EFF. Now give me the games. And that was okay. That was part of the deal. You could do that. Um, so it was the EFF. There were two charities. It was the EFF and Child's Play. No, wait. Child's Play. <laughs> Uh, Child's Play, for those that haven't heard of it, it's the Penny Arcade guys uh, did this, uh, the comic strip guys. And it's, it's a big charity. They make a lot. They bring in a lot of money every year, and what they dump that money into is bringing game consoles and video games to sick children in hospitals, which is like, I, like if you could like rescue puppies from something, that would make it like the most heart, you know, warming charity ever. So um, it's not for medical research, not for anything like that. It's just to make a sick kid's day suck a little less. So uh, it was, it was a good charity. And you know, if you thought that was a waste of your money, and you thought that the these guys were, you know, much better. You could say, I want, I, I can dictate exactly where my funds will go for this. So everyone had a really good feeling about this. Um, now, what these people told me, this is a direct quote from the email that John sent me when they first pitched this idea to me, when I told him to put Aquaria in there, too. He said, the kicker is that if the deal reaches a million dollars of total donations, the source code to all the games will become available. And that's what the Wolfire crew said to me. And my inner monologue said, whatever you say. Because um, I was like, okay, sure, you know, you're going to make, like, You'll make twenty thousand dollars off of this, and it'll be like incredible because you know you're all making video games and eating ramen noodles to survive. So that's going to be a lot of money, and you're going to just—it's going to be just mind blowing when you make ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars. So at the end of the promotion, a week later, when we were sitting on one point two million dollars, nobody knew what to do with this. Holy shit! Um, <laughs> But they did open source those games. Aquaria was released under the GPL. Well, they open sourced most of them. Let me get the slide back here. Okay, Aquaria went under the GPL. Gish, I think, went under the GPL. Lugaru went under the GPL. And oh, while I have the slide up here, you all see this guy all the way over here? Samaros 2 donated that game for free when he saw how much money was coming in. He said, I just want to make sure some more money's coming into this thing. This is a big deal for indie people. It's a big deal for charity. I don't know. Um, maybe they cut him a check, but as far as m I'm understanding, the agreement was he just gave it away for free. He just said, I just want to make this thing a little better so that more money comes in for all the people that deserve it, which is an incredible act of honest-to-God charity. Um, uh, okay, so... How did we do overall with the Humble Bundle 1? 1. 1.2, I'm not going to read that whole number off to you. 127, no, 1,273,000 some dollars. Uh, that broke down to about $166,000 for each game. Now remember, one of those games was written by a guy in high school by himself. Not a bad little paycheck for a game he had written a couple years ago, too, might I add. Um, $183,000 to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Not a bad day for freedom. And $180,000. $8,000 for Child's Play. Not a bad day for sick kids, except unfortunately they're still sick. Um, people said this was a flash in the pan. It would not happen if you did it twice. <laughs> the first one made $1.2 million. The next made one8 The one after that made $2.6 uh, 2.16, then 2.37, and then the fifth one, which was particularly a good bundle. I mean, like as far as like fine wines go, it was a good bundle. 5.1 million dollars in one week, not too shabby. Uh, and they did some other things. They started putting, 
you know, some bonus games in there. Like if, you know, if you beat the average, they would throw a couple of everyone that contributed thus far, they would throw an extra game in for you and stuff like that. So they, they, they became very good at the psychology of it. And one of the things they did that was very, very important was they put a little pie chart on there. If anyone's ever been to Humble Bundle, you've seen this pie chart. It tells you exactly what platform people are buying these games for. And how much they spent. And how much they spent. Um, and I say this for a reason, because Linux people, Every bundle that has ever been on the humble on the humble bundle, and I don't know if this is true. I haven't followed the last ten of these or so, but universally, almost if not completely universally, the Linux people have given more money than any other platform, including the Mac people. Now, there's less of them. Let's be fair. There's a, it's just a smaller market. There's more people with Macs theoretically than have Linux. There's definitely more people that theoretically that have Windows than Linux. But so, we understand it's a smaller market. There were less Linux users giving money like in terms of like warm bodies. But there was more Linux users giving more, there was Linux users who were giving more money per person. And this is a round number, it's not exactly 25%, but for a long time and possibly still, the Humble Bundle's income is, their, third, their revenue is 25% Linux users. Um, now the reason, the way they tell you this is uh, when, when you buy the game, they look at what web browser you have. If it reports you're on Linux, they say you're a Linux user. And there's a little checkbox so you can change if they got it wrong or if you want to also give a shout out to Mac OS or something like that um, for whatever reason. Um, but, but you can see dollar for dollar, like okay, the Mac people are giving $5 on average for all the Mac users and the Linux people are giving Eight dollars, nine dollars. It was not just a couple pennies more. It was quite a bit more. Uh, did they have something to prove? I don't know. I don't know what the psychology of it is. I think it's probably a market that's less saturated with shit. Um, anyone can get a thousand clones of Flappy Bird on Windows or Diablo Three or whatever your favorite clone is. But a good quality, honest to god, earnestly made game harder to come by on Linux, and the Linux users came out and rewarded them heavily for it. Um, and still do. And I, I don't have a slide for this, I don't have the exact number, but they've done bundles that were Steam only before there was a Steam on Linux, and Windows only. Uh, for example, the, the humble THQ bundle, which was like Saints Row and other Windows only titles. And the Linux users still represented. So, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you about that. The, the point is that there are Linux users out there and they have money and they want to spend it on games. And I've stuck my fingers down my throat so many times listening to people say, oh, there's no money in the Linux industry. There's no money in Linux games. Why would you ever support those people? And, you know, it's like, the Linux people are like, well, you know, maybe you should pay attention to the numbers. Then this happened. Um, for those that don't recognize this, that's the Heavy. It's a character class from Team Fortress 2, a game by Valve. Uh, the thing he's holding might be a turret from Portal. I'm not sure what that is exactly. Oh, it's, oh, it's a sandwich. <laughs> Oh, it is a sandwich. I never noticed that. Okay. Um, there, there's a long-running joke in TF2 about the sandwich. It's, I'm not going to get into it. Um, but for those of you that don't remember your history, this is what the iPod ads looked like back when we were talking about iPods instead of iPhones. Um, it was always like this neon background and a black silhouette of a dancer dancing with what was clearly a white iPod and headphones on. Uh, and they were really cool commercials. They were really, you know, earth-shattering in terms of marketing at the time, and they're very, very recognizable. So Valve started posting pictures of characters from their games in Mac advertisements. Uh, the other one, I don't have this, the picture here, but they had a picture of uh, the Portal 2 turret and some busted-ass looking old turret from like Team Fortress 2, and one said, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC. Um, <laughs> we've all seen that commercial too. So this happened. Steam for, uh, Steam for Mac OS happened. I know you're like, what? this is a Linux talk, why are you talking about Mac OS? The people who did the Mac OS port at Valve, and they had called me up and I just bought a house, and they're like, come move to Seattle and work for us. And I was like, I just bought a house in Charlotte, a bit of a commute. Um, but I came in, I helped them with some things, and they did most of the work, of course, but they shipped Steam for Mac OS. And what they wanted to do was look at that, and they wanted to look at the numbers from Humble Bundle and say, because the people who did the Mac version, between you and me, they were Linux users but they also knew how to pick their battles. And they said, we can do a Mac version of this where people believe there's money so there will be no resist, there'll be less resistance to doing this inside Valve itself. Now, legend has it that there is somewhere on a shelf in Valve a complete gold master of Half-Life 1 for Mac OS 9. It was done, all it had to do was go to reproduction and it would be for sale. And they said, eh, we don't want to do it. I don't know if that's true, I've heard that's true. Um, it, 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 it's believable enough if, uh, if it isn't true. 
But so there was some concern that Valve would push back and say, we won't, don't want to do a Mac version. We don't want to do a Mac version. But they said, OK, they, they pushed hard enough. They said, OK, there's definitely a market now because the iPods have gotten really popular. And there's this whole switcher campaign for, from Apple for the Macs. And you know, it seems like their numbers are increasing. And my god, they can pay for a $3,000 laptop. They can probably buy a couple of $5 games off Steam. So they shipped this thing. And their numbers were, I mean, you know, the Mac version is never, ever going to beat the Windows version. There's just not enough warm bodies. But they saw enough return on investment to, from that to say, OK, this was a good idea. And then those people that did the Mac version said, let's do the Linux version of it. So then this happened. And um, let's see. Steam for Linux shipped. Um, they announced it ahead of time. Oh, where'd my slide go? I had one in here. They, they put out a blog post called Steamed, Steamed Penguins. Uh, talking about how we're going to do this, we're going to ship a Linux client, we're going to do Left 4 Dead 2, we're going to do a port of that, and we'll see what happens from there. And the world went nuts. Um, Slashdot went nuts, Reddit went nuts, everyone went nuts. Um, so they shipped it, Steam for Linux. Uh, full support for Steamworks features, uh, Steam Play, which is to say you buy the game once on whatever platform you want, and it's available on every platform that the game ships on. So if you bought the Windows version of it, but there also happens to be a Linux port of this game on Steam, you get it for free. You don't have to buy per platform, which was always kind of a roadblock if you go back to the Loki days. In the Loki days, we had so much trouble from people saying, hey, we already bought this game a month ago on Windows, and now you want me to pay full price for the Linux version? And there was never a really good answer to this. And Loki had a great problem. It was called retail distribution. Now, when you're shipping your games over an Ethernet wire, that problem goes away. And you don't have to sell your game for $60. And you can, if the main developer's getting it all because it's all done by the same company, it's not really a problem. So Steam Play solved a lot of problems. If, if you bought the game and it happened to be on Linux and Mac in addition to Windows, you got it on all three platforms, one price. It was great, um, which also was a benefit to people that were heavy Steam users before, that when the Linux version shipped, congratulations, you already have 100 games in your library. All right. You know, so, um, so as it stands right now, as of last week when I checked this number, a, a couple of weeks ago, we just passed the 500 games on Linux mark. You can buy 500 separate, honest to god, Linux games on Steam and play them immediately. Um, the estimate is there will be 700 by the end of the year. We have a little less than six months to make that happen. But, um, and that seems like, you know, of course there's going to be a wave of people that already had Linux versions. For example, all those Humble Bundle games like Lugaru and Aquarian and stuff, those are all up there because we already had those Linux versions. But people have to start from scratch once you get that initial wave of people that had no barrier to entry. They already had a Linux port. Um, but then this happened. Has anyone heard of this, SteamOS? Valve is shipping their own Linux distribution. And what they want to do is compete with game consoles, which is crazy gravy. That is a nuts idea. Uh, the modern philosophy has always been you cannot compete with Nintendo and Sony. And then Microsoft showed up. It's like, OK, you can compete with them if you have billions of dollars. Um, but then Ouya showed up. And then Android consoles showed up. And then one-off tablets for Android, and et cetera, et cetera, like that. And then we started to realize that you, know, you can actually do a micro console. You don't have to compete at the Xbox 360 level, the Xbox One level, uh, or the PlayStation 4 level. You can do something smaller. But Steam is taking a slightly different approach. Valve is taking a different approach with SteamOS. It's a Linux kernel. It's based on Debian. Um, the, 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 the user space is based on De Debian. And then they built their own tech, tech on top of that to give you kind of that like console-y, okay, you play with a game controller, and there's a nice user interface for selecting your games and downloading them. But th they did it more like the Android model. And th this, they have beta shipping of this. The actual final things are not shipping for a little while yet. But they, um, 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 oh, I forgot what I was going to say. I hate when that happens when I'm on stage in front of all these people. Um, they did it more like the Android model, where they, uh, Google said, here's Android. Here's the source code to it. Do whatever you want. And instead of having like, like Apple has, where you have one iPhone or a couple of different models of iPhones, you have the Android model where you can have millions of different phones. And they all have roughly the same base. And that brings some different problems, as anyone that's ever used an Android phone understands. But you, you have this democratization of hardware. Um, and Valve's going to do the same thing. Valve's not going to ship a console. Or if they do, they'll ship just kind of like a, like this is roughly our idea of a console. What they want other people to do, they want uh, computer makers, PC makers, to ship their own consoles and say, it's a SteamOS box. The same way you might say, this is an Android phone. Whereas, this is an Android phone doesn't tell you that much about the phone by itself. Um, and in that case, you don't have to compete to have the lowest price hard hardware made by the lowest bidders. You don't have to fight 
against Microsoft to have cheaper hardware made by made in batches of a million, uh, and Sony for that matter. And you don't have to have a hardware design at all. You just have to say it looks like a PC that runs Linux, more or less. Um, and then you can have people that want to have, you know, the top shelf good champagne, you know, Apple model, where it's like I'm going to pay top dollar to get the best highest powered console I can with the best video card and the best whatever. And you can also have the people who are now at the OUYA level where it's like, I paid $75 for this. It has kind of not the best video chip in it, but it plays the casual games my mom wants to play. You know, um, so th that in itself is interesting. But I got to tell you a story about Jonathan Blow real quick. Um, I said the thing about Humble Bundle before. And you'll, if you know the history of Humble Bundle, Humble Bundle 1 did not have Braid in it. They called him, they asked, and he said, I don't think so. This seems like a silly idea. I don't know exactly what he said. He was probably more polite than that. But we hit $1.2 million, and the phone starts ringing. Um, you'll note that Braid is in the second Humble Indie Bundle, but also people started calling me because they'd be like, I want to get into the next bundle you guys do because I want a chunk, I want a slice of that pie. I want that $1.2 million or whatever. I want my piece of that. And they said, well, that's cool. Do you have a Linux port? No. Well, you can't be in the bundle then. <laughs> and rules have loosened since then, of course. But at the time, it was like, no Linux port, no deal. We got lots of other games we can put in here. So people I've never heard of started calling me and being like, I need to get my game port to Linux as fast as possible because I want to go back and present this to the Humble Bundle guys and get into the next bundle. Um, we had ported, I had ported Braid, so they, and that's why I had suggested it for the first bundle. And then Jonathan Blow said, hey, you know, maybe this is something that I should be experimenting with. And Lord knows at this point, bundles are the way that we're selling stuff now. It's not just the Humble Indie Bundle. There's a million knockoffs, and there's, hum, there's bundles for story, uh, for, for e-books and audio books and comic books and music and blah, 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 and other video game ones and stuff. So it was an idea whose time had come. But um, the reason I say this to you is that there are lots of people that would not have taken a phone call from me and other Linux porting type people that as soon as SteamOS was announced and Valve put their money and their weight behind it, suddenly my phone starts ringing again and it's AAA titles and they're like, there's a new console and we want to get in there because it's getting so much press. And Valve did Steam Dev Days, which is a conference much like this. Um, and that just got everyone's excitement even higher for it. So now we have all these games that are coming in there. And so I had said, you know, can we get to 700 games by the end of the year? Well, there's been, I think Steam is two now, or it's about to be two on Linux. There's people that have been working on porting games for a long time. So there's probably going to be another wave of games flooding in now. And then eventually, in a perfect world, we'll get to the point where people are just developing for Linux from the start, the same way they developed for Windows and maybe a console or whatnot. So, um, so 700 games by the end of the year is totally possible, and that number only goes up from there. So that's good news for Linux people. Oh, and then this happened. Um, there's something called Unreal Engine. I mentioned Tim Sweeney earlier. Um, I ran into Tim at a party. Sounds like a bad start to a joke, but no. I, I, I ran into him at a, the opening of Epic's offices in Seattle, and I said, Tim, it's been many years since I've seen you. He used to jokingly introduce me to people as the Linux game industry. Hey, this is Ryan. He's the Linux game industry. <laughs> so having not seen him for many years and having had a really bad time with Unreal, uh, with Unreal Tournament 3, which probably caused him no end of agony, I run into him at this party. And he goes, hey, it's the Linux game industry. Oh, shit. OK. Uh, so I said, hey, Tim, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm not doing so much technical stuff now. I'm running the business. Uh, I'm doing more business stuff for Epic Games now. And I said, Tim, that's a waste of your talent, and which is a really rude thing to say. I shouldn't have said it. It just came out of my mouth. Um, but he's a brilliant engineer, and I was surprised that he was going to do business suit stuff. He was going to deal with navigating the business. There's lots of business people there that could do that for him. And uh, and I, he was polite about it. He's a very kind person, but I, was prob I probably insulted him. But having watched what happened in the next few months after that party, you know what? I was fucking wrong. Um, Unreal Engine is now an open source project, sort of. Um, AAA uh, Engine, this is the best games in the world, the most technically advanced games in the world. Those are not the same thing. But the most technologically advanced games in the world are being built on this right now. And they said, here's what we do. $19, you get a copy of the engine source code. Every piece of it, it's literally on GitHub. Um, and you, you pay them your $19, and they give you access to the Unreal Engine account on GitHub. Uh, and you can clone from there. Um, you pay them $19 a month, and when you ship 5% 5 5 of your revenue, which might be a lot, might be if you're doing a zero price game, you pay them nothing. 
except for your $19. If you stop paying them, you get to keep whatever code drop you have. You don't have to pay them $19 a month forever. So if you decide you've got good enough code, you just stop. Um, it's on GitHub, I mentioned that. They sh when they announce this deal where they're gonna give the source code out to anyone who wants it without any prior credential check or making sure whatever, um, they said at the time, they, they did this at GDC, Game Developer Conference this year, and in their private rooms, they were showing the engine running on Steam OS, which that is to say they showed it running on Linux the day they announced it. And by version 4.1, that is a month after the thing first shipped, full Linux support in the engine, shipping to everyone that has uh, access to their GitHub account. Um, the editor for Unreal has been a contentious item for over a decade now because we kept promising it, and for Unreal Engine 3, they, they switched over to WX widgets for their GUI toolkit so we could get a Linux and Mac, Mac port of it, and it never happened for a lot of reasons which aren't worth getting into. But we had promised it, and we had promised it, and we had promised it, and when I say we, I mean me and Epic. We're not the same people, of course. But, um, but finally, with the source code on GitHub for Unreal Engine 4, about a month after it shipped, Rabid Linux users in an IRC channel got the fucking editor running on Linux natively, 100% talking to X11. Um, in the month after that, we've got talking 100% to SDL so that when you switch your display server from X11 to Mirror or Wayland, it's just gonna work. You're not even gonna have to recompile it. It's a good deal. Um, this is historic history in the making, and this is a historic event, specifically having that editor running, because this is the first time with the Unreal Engine, and that is to say with the tools that maybe possibly we're all gonna be using, this is the first time not only can you run a game on Linux that's Unreal based, you can make a game on Linux that's Unreal based, which is remarkable, um, and I can't wait to see what happens with that, because there's other things that make Linux games, like Unity, which is incredibly good too, but there is no Unity tools on Linux. You build it on Windows, or I think Mac OS, and you hit the port to Linux button. I'm not kidding, I'm pretty sure it's a one-click thing to do it. That's good, but you can't, you still need a Windows box or a Mac to build, to design and construct your game in the first place. Um, so this is, this is going to be a big thing in the future, and I think it's going to push other people. Because you could see immediately Crytek and Unity both said, oh yeah, we have similar projects, plans coming for our thing, the second Epic announced this. Because this is, this is not done in the game industry. This is really a sea change, and I'm pretty sure this was Tim's idea, so. Um, I was wrong to tell him he was a bad businessman. Um, all right, I'm at the end of my talk here. I have two more slides. Usually I have a lot more points on here. <laughs> What you can do, do you want to be part of this? Do you want to help the cause? Do you want to have an effort on the future? Usually it's like buy Linux games. Don't buy things on Windows if there's no Linux port, blah, blah, blah. Fuck all that, make a game. The tools are out there now. There are tools out there that are incredibly good to use that you can use on Linux without any programming experience. Now, programming experience always helps. I don't mean to minimize that. I'm a programmer myself. But we're at the point where if you're, you think of yourself more as an artist, or you think of yourself more as like someone that animates stick figures, that would be me, I guess, um, you can still build a game. And the thing is, what I've learned, where's that quote? Hey, there's that business guy again I made fun of. I think we're heading towards a future where AAA is the minority, said Tim Sweeney about a month ago. He thinks the next generation of games are gonna be made by indie people, which has always been true. Remember that slide for Doom? That was four guys in a garage. Now, granted, they got big from there, and Epic was very much in a similar situation, but we're at the point where people aren't making small games so they can get big. They're making small games because they mean something, and it's something they're passionate about, and it's something they love. And we're at the point where now we have distributions, and we have uh, distribution channels like Steam and Desura and other things like that, and we have resources where you don't need a million dollars to get a powerful engine or a million dollars just to get anything at all or a, a team of people together. The tools are much better than they used to be. You can go out and make a game that means something to you, that tells your personal story. And we're starting to see this. We're starting to see things like Braid, which had something personal to say, and things like Pop Papa Iyo, which is a game about a person, the game developer wrote a game about his alcoholic father. And it's awesome and terrifying. But we're at the point where you can have that voice and not worry about what Nintendo will say or Sony will say. So what I say to you, go and make a game. It's time to do it. And make it for Linux, but make a game. Anyway, that's my talk. Thank you very much. I think I have 10 minutes for questions, but we fucked around with the MacBook for 10 minutes, so I don't know. I'm gonna take questions till they kick me off the stage. You had your hand up for like an hour, I'm sorry. 
I was not involved with the Civ Five port. That, um, that, was, that was Asper Media. Aspire, I think that's pronounced, but um, Aspire, I don't know. Um, th this is actually a good point because the other thing that just shipped was XCOM Enemy Unknown, done by Feral Interactive. If you don't know Feral Interactive, it's because they only do one thing. They ship Mac games. Oh, look at that. They're shipping Linux games now. Figure that one out. Um, it's a good game. You should get it. It's a real native Linux port, too. Um, uh, you, in the back. Well, I have a whole talk about that. He asked what tools you would use to make games in Linux. If you wait another month, I would seriously recommend Unreal. I think it's, they have a system in there called Blueprints, which is phenomenal, and you can build a whole lot of game without a lot of code. Um, it's, it's kind of game changing, if you can forgive the pun. Um, Unity is really, really good if you want to hit the ground running. Like I said, you can't use it on Linux, but lots of really good Linux games, uh, like Gone Home, for example, and uh, Rochard and numbers of other things have shipped for Linux by people that literally don't have Linux installed. They don't know any, they're not Linux experts. So those would be the two tools I would take now if you want to make something big and easy. One second, yes. Is there an answer that, that we can, right now there's just a rash of people putting out Linux ports of games that don't know anything about Linux. Okay. And almost every one of them has multi-monitor support broken. Horribly. Is there an easy place I can point those people to to get their head out? <laughs> um, okay, uh, what he asked is, he said there's a, there's a rash of Linux games coming in, which you said that like that was a bad thing. I'll forgive you for it. Um, but he said that almost every game that ships for Linux has really bad multi-monitor support. Um, there's two things that I can recommend. One, X11's a steaming pile of shit. <laughs> you know this because there's two competing projects to replace it, and everyone's angry about that, but um, multi-monitor in X11 will never work well. It works okay until you need to do something useful with it. Um, <laughs> uh, and we, we've spent a lot of time working around it, but uh, what I would tell people to do is use use SDL if you're using the lowest level, and if your engine, if I don't know what Unity uses, I don't uh, Unreal uses SDL. I don't know what Unity uses, but if your engine's not using it, you should be using SDL2. And it has something in there called full screen desktop mode, which basically says, just give me the resolution of the monitor. I don't, don't screw around with trying to get to like a 640 by 480 context or something. Just give me whatever the monitor's at right now and do the right thing. And it can specify, I want it on this monitor or this monitor and enumerate what monitors are out there. Most people do it wrong. It's not hard to do it right, but the first step is you have to be using SDL because we spent literally hundreds of man hours trying to make that work right. And sometimes it still doesn't, because the only thing that's worse than X11 is X11 window managers. Um, they all do it slightly differently. Um, yes? How good is the OpenGL documentation? <laughs> How good is the OpenGL documentation? Very good, if you speak Martian. <laughs> It's very, very heavily and well documented, but it uses a lot of things that are incredibly frustrating. For example, a lot of how you get to useful features in OpenGL are through extensions. You say, hey, does this video card support some magical thing that OpenGL by default doesn't? And you say, oh, it does, that's cool. The documentation for those does the most obnoxious thing in the world for every extension. This is the format they use. They say, take the OpenGL specification, which is hundreds of pages, and on page 42, replace this paragraph with this one. Holy shit, so like you're sitting there trying to figure out, usually you can piece it together just based on the extension documentation, but when you're trying to kind of parse like, well they say that, but does it interfere with this? I don't know. I mean, it's, it, that is really frustrating. The other thing that's incredibly frustrating about OpenGL documentation is that the documentation, all the functions in OpenGL start with the letters G and L, lowercase. GL, well there's no under, well yeah, underscore for like enumerations, but the functions are like GL begin or whatever, they don't use that call ever. but. Um, the documentation does not put that GL on the front of it. So now you're Googling for the word begin. <laughs> it's gonna go well, it's gonna go well. Um, and that's stupid and it's anachronistic and that's what they did. The, uh, the initial documentation, the format they took for it was probably written before Google existed at SGI. Um, and it never changed, because you, know, you, you build a culture and the culture resists change. It doesn't matter whether it's OpenGL or any other culture of any kind on the planet. Um, and that's just an unfortunate thing and it's caused problems. Um, there are lots and lots of really good books written about OpenGL, but it's really, really easy to drown in them. Um, sometimes all you want to do is get some shit to the screen, right? You don't want to get into all the fancy stuff. Um, and then there's backwards compatibility. OpenGL has spent a lot of time doing things that were great for cars that were, that were uh, produced in 1998. Um, and 
you wouldn't ever want to talk to a video card that way in modern times. You would want to talk to it in a totally different way. So they have new functions to deal with the way you want to do it and shader programs and the programmable pipeline, but then you still have all those old functions. And it's not always clear which ones you should and should not be using. And usually you have to get it wrong until you get it right. And sometimes the drivers make it hard to know when you've gotten it right. And it's a mess. My hope is that we're about to move past OpenGL to, uh, I don't know what to call them, next gen APIs like Metal and Mantle and DirectX 12 and whatever the next version of OpenGL will look like, which will probably be similar, which basically says take all of that stuff and throw it the fuck out. And you have this very small thing, you have command buffers, you manage them, you do whatever you want with threading and keeping track of this stuff and you send it to the card and it's incredibly low level and it's hard to juggle but it's all simple and does exactly what it says. There's so much in the OpenGL state machine that's hard to keep track of in modern times. Um, and whatever the next thing is that OpenGL does and those other APIs solves that problem a lot better. To answer your question, the documentation's a certain, there's a certain way of life to the documentation and you have to adapt to it. But it is very, very well documented once you get to that point. Uh, I have two minutes left. Any other questions? Yes. Um, do you think this current situation will help uh, improve quality free software drivers? What's the current situation? Uh, you're asking if we will get good quality free software drivers. Um, when we get to those next APIs, is that what you're asking? Or just in, are you talking about Steam? Or, okay, okay. Um, it's better than you think right now. Um, I was surprised that somebody took the NVIDIA hardware and reverse engineered it enough that you can run shaders on those things. And uh, I mean, this is true of any OpenGL driver, no matter whether it's commercial and closed sourced or written by people that are sitting in their garage with a oscilloscope trying to figure out how the hardware works. They're all broken until about a week after a game ships that breaks them. And then they go, oh, well, that's slow on our card because he did something that's totally correct for the spec, but our hardware didn't expect or our drivers didn't expect. And then they fix it and we all go on. And that's true for the open source ones as much as everything else. And all of these games have gone a long way to fix it. I've gotten a lot of bug reports where it's like, this just crashes on startup on Mesa with the Intel drivers. Send it on to Ian. And Ian goes, oh, I broke it. And Ian Romnick fixes it. And we go on to, and his team, which is surprisingly good. We used to make fun of Intel for their video chips, but they've actually gotten to be pretty good. Like, you shouldn't feel bad about them, and they're really committed to open source drivers. Like, Intel pays people on staff to do that. So, that future's getting brighter every day, and it already doesn't suck. If you'd asked me three years ago, it sucked. But it's already getting better, and it's getting better all the time. So, uh, any other questions? Anyone? I saw someone. I didn't mean to scare you off. We have time. It's okay. I'm going to ignore him when he tells me to stop anyway. No? Okay. Um, I'm around for questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Oh, also, you can hire me if you want. Uh, <laughs> I forgot to say that. Darn. All right.